you know, a buddy of mine, he Gomes likes to say that never was a magazine called corn, but I like corn because corn seldom kills you. So if I had to choose one or the other, I'd take corn because I can ski steeper stuff. I can ski with less clothing. I'm not good in flat light. So yeah, I love corn. Welcome to season 12, episode two of the Backcountry Podcast. I'm Adam Howard. Jeffrey Bergeron, a.k.a. Biff America, has spent the last 50 years living in the mountains, mainly in Breckenridge, Colorado. And yet his signature accent and brash personality, rooted in the south shore of Massachusetts, is as rich as it was the day he moved west. Likewise, his sharp and self-deprecating sense of humor is evident throughout his writing and, as you'll hear in this episode as well. In addition to his columns, which have been published in Backcountry since 1994, He's also published two books under the backcountry flag. Biff's colorful career spans stints on the radio and television, waiting tables, politics, and even a spell as a stand-up comedian. At the core of it all, though, is skiing or mountain biking. Biff has logged 100-plus days a year on snow for the better part of five decades. Nowadays, he spends most of his time skiing the backcountry away from the crowds and six-pack chairlifts at Breck. He finds inspiration for his writing in the skin track and simply by, quote-unquote, paying attention to the little things that make up his daily life. Those little things that we can all register with. He travels the country in his camper with his mate Ellen, chasing snow in the spring or single track in the summer. And of course, more stories to share. We caught up with Biff in between adventures to learn where the name Biff America came from. And much, much more. You won't want to miss this one. We'd like to thank Gordini for supporting this episode and independent media. Gordini has been redefining the cold weather experience through outdoor gear and glove innovation for more than 66 years. Based in Vermont, family-run and independently owned, Gordini has focused on the same mission since its founding in 1956, to keep you outside longer. From introducing the first ever down and leather ski mittens to, this year, launching the industry's first dual-layer ski sock, Innovation is always done in the spirit of problem-solving and progress. Gordini believes that the future is in all our hands, and now, our feet. See what drives their product and their passions at gordini.com. All right, friends, let's get into it. We hope you enjoy this new episode. Jeffrey Bergeron, a.k.a. Biff America, welcome to the Backcountry Podcast. Hey, thanks. I've been sitting by the phone like a leper on prom night waiting for you to invite me in to this thing. This is an honor for me. It's an honor for me too. After all the years we've worked together. Yeah. Um, you know, the older I get, the more I think of, and you're way older than me. You're like 10 times older than me. Yeah. yeah. You are building my age. (laughs) Numbers keep coming into my head. It's like the more, the older I get, the more numbers, like how many magazines have we made? How many, how many days have I skied? How many columns have I written? But I'll never catch up to you. Uh, and I, I just want to ask, I got two questions to start. How many days do you think you've skied in your life? You know what? I knew oh, my life. Fuck. Yeah, your I, life. I, oh, okay. I, I knew you were going to ask something like this. So I have one of these smart watches, you know? And so I went yeah. through my watch last, you know, to see, you know, every time I do something, you know, I, last year I skied 138 days, um, you know, from, from like early November, late October till you know, I think July 4th was my last day, but I don't ski much like in June. But yeah, God, I don't know, man. I think I've been in, in living in ski resorts for 50 winters. So, it, you know, and, and, you know, there was some of those winters, I had a little bit of a lifestyle problem, so I didn't ski nearly as much. But, you right. know, since, since I've been married for 30 years and she kind of cleaned me up. And since then, I've been, I God, I don't think I had a year under 100 days. You know? Even when you were working all the time. Yeah, well, I never really worked I mean, that much. all the time, yeah. Yeah. There. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, like I, I worked early on until in my until my 30s, I worked, you know, as a as a waiter all over the country and a bartender, but I'd come back to Breck every winter. And, and so I had a lot of my days free. And then when Biff happened, you know, I was I was doing radio or TV, mostly in morning shows or evening shows. And, and so, yeah, I had my days free. But, you know, when I say skiing, I do a lot of... Uh, you know, do a fair amount of backcountry skiing, probably mostly, you know, with skins and heavier gear. But I also do a lot of what I'd call like backcountry cross country with with a double camber. In the old days, it was wax metal edge ski where you just go and wander and try and try to 
try to try to make turns on light gear. So I do a lot of that still, you know. Well, well, like me, you're very eclectic in your approach to skiing. You skate ski, you classic ski, you race, even though you're terrible at it. Also, <laughs> like me, you tour, you do what you you know what you're calling XCD or I. What growing up here in Vermont, we called that backcountry skiing, double camber yeah. skis. Yeah. Um, and and it's all good and. And it seems like, well, do you feel like that it used to be like people are so they they like to put things in boxes so they can understand it. Yeah. And, you know, we once had we work on this magazine Cross Country Skier and and uh, one of the kids that was working on it with me early on was um was a carnival skier for Bates. And um, of course we're primarily backcountry and we're out out west touring and somebody asked him, So do you do any real skiing? And and this kid is a super high level athlete and, yeah. and a Nordic skier. And, and the dude meant it. He was not joking yeah. around like as if that was just like something, I don't even know what he exactly meant, but I tend to look at skiing as like, man, when you got boots on your feet and skis connected, it's a good day. Yeah. You know, and you don't have to ride a lift and fight these crazy crowds that you guys now have. And they're yeah. all over the place. So I appreciate you. Yeah, you know, I haven't, uh, uh, I I haven't ridden a lift to to for gravity skiing probably in four or five years. I've ridden a lift. No kidding. To, to access the backcountry, like you can you can ride a lift in in Breck and you can get to the ten mile range. But yeah, you know what? Um, I have just found, you know, where Breckenridge is really crowded, and 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 I have never been a fast skier. I think I think you skied with me on these uh these ski tests, and uh, you know, I make a lot of turns. And it's it's getting to the point. Where there's so many with so many other options here at Breck. I don't uh, I don't ride lifts that much. You know, if I go to Monarch or or some of these other uh, other smaller Loveland, I'll I'll ride some lifts. But as far as locally, yeah, people are going. They, it's it's just a little bit uh, it's a little bit um, sketchy, less relaxing for me when I'm having you know swinging dicks coming flying by me with a, you know with absolutely no control, and I'm thinking. Yeah. You know, my wife is going to be spending my 401k after I'm dead. So I, I'm, I'm going to try to cautious about that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, our little hill here, Smuggler's Notch, just has yeah. old doubles. Yeah. And the pace, you can't go out early morning and bang out your X vertical, X thousand vertical and get to work. You can't go fast. And so yeah. pace of the day, even on busy days, is just much slower because the crowds are at the bottom. Yep. And the trails can only get so congested and our trails are like technical and, and challenging. So it's good. Yeah. But, you know, you go over to Stowe from here and it's, it's combat skiing, I call it. And yep. it's, it's really not, I don't know. Uh, you know, I, it's a different I, sport. It really is a different sport. I think, I think these high capacity chairlifts, these six packs, you know, high capacity chairlifts have totally changed the vibe of the sport. And, and also, you know, like let's say Breckenridge, we get, you know, I think a busy day at Breckenridge might be 20, 20, 30,000 or something like that. I mean, that's like the busiest day. You know, they don't release their numbers, but it, it's a whole different vibe with these, uh, these two pack chairlifts, you know? And I think, it, I think, I think that I would, I'd encourage other resorts to do that, but I don't think it's uh, fiscally feasible. Well, it's wild. I, I once heard a stat on Breckenridge that they, they do more skier days than the entire state of Vermont in a year. I, yeah, just, I can believe that. Yeah, I can um, believe that. Yeah, and and granted, it's bigger. It's it's there's more space, but yeah, you know. And for those people that are uh, listening to this or watching this, I wouldn't discourage anyone from coming here to ski. I mean, it is an amazing experience for a visitor. We have high alpine bowls. We have a buttload of a terrain. Um, it's just personally, I mean, I literally can put my skis on my my I call it a kick and glide backcountry cross country skis on in my driveway and get to two different zip codes. So I just have other options and other interests. It is still a cool place to come and to visit. And there's so many other things you can do, but just for me at my age and my, and my, my miles per hour on, on snow, um, I, you know, I prefer to do other things. Yeah. Are you getting a kickback, uh, from the chamber of commerce for, for all of that? No, no, no. But I am on the Breckers town council. So you, oh, know, so we, you can't we, take that money. You can't, oh, you, yeah. you got, or at least you can't, take that money. Yeah. You know what? I, I always think, I, I think payola is, is gets a bad rap. I encourage it, you know, 
Well, how else are you going to survive in a town no. like Breckenridge? No, no, no kidding. You can't no sell kidding. drugs anymore. No, no, that, did, that, that didn't work out well for me. So let, let's talk about Breck for a second. And, and you were there. You, you arrived from, from Massachusetts in, in the late 70s. No, uh, yeah. By accident. Mm-hmm. Um, let's start with, just take us through how Breck became your home. Well, you know, I, I never skied growing up. I, I, grew, I was born in Brockton, Massachusetts, grew up the next town, went to high school the next town over, had never skied. I was a decent football player and I was going to go to one year PG because I had a grade point average of a plant in high school. And so I was going to go to prep school for one year. I got a hernia, couldn't do that, couldn't play football. So hell, I'm not going to go to college. And my buddy Keith, um, he, you know, he was, he grew up, you know, going to church camps at skiing and, you know, he's Lutheran. So, uh, so his people skied and, uh, we saw that movie, Jeremiah Johnson and, and said, he said, let's go to Colorado. So we, we actually, we were going to go to Utah. And then, uh, so we had a Volkswagen square back. We left, uh, we left Brockton and, uh, and I had no, I had never been out of other than New Hampshire with my parents. I'd never been uh, out of Massachusetts and I had no idea I even had an accent. And we got to Independence, Missouri, and uh, uh, we, we had a, a, a leak in our, our, our tire, and we didn't have a jack. So we heard there's a Mon, uh, Montgomery Wards uh, that had auto parts. So I went to a gas station. Go, hey, uh, where's Montgomery Wards? And and the guy looked at me like I was speaking Greek. And uh, and so then Keith was walking out, and he says, "I think we have an accent." So we uh, we we gone away to Utah. We got to Breckenridge because I had a friend here that I used to wait on tables with on Cape Cod and I uh, stayed with him for a couple of days and uh, coming back from, from town one night, uh, Keith and I drove, uh, rolled our car into uh, the Blue River and uh, we decided to stay in Breckenridge after that. And, and that was, that was it. I had never skied. The first time I did ski was actually back country because I was so concerned about making a fool of myself uh, before the lift started running. Like I think the opening day was Thanksgiving back then. Keith and I hiked up with this gear that I had just bought. And he's trying to show me the rudiments of uh, how to get down the hill alive. So, and then after that, Breckenridge became my home. I'd leave, I'd be here in the winter time and then go to other resorts to wait on tables at 10 bar in the summer. And at that time you could kind of still afford to do that. Has, has it changed? I mean, Oh Jesus. Are you seeing young Jeffries coming to town and finding a place to rent and dirt bagging? I mean, no. No. Is the is the ski bum dead as as you knew it? Yeah, well, you know what? In the soon to be published Backcountry magazine column, I think it's called the Working Class or the Blue Collar Issue. I wrote a column just about that. Uh, you know, and no, there there it's um it's a lot more difficult. I mean, I would I would leave in the in the in spring, sometimes bicycle to my next resort, whatever you know, like California or some yeah, and and I could come back in the winter and find a place to live. Right now, the average home price in Breckenridge is 2.1 million. And, you know, though Breckenridge is built, a cause to be built about 1,500 workforce housing units that are cheaper and deed de- restricted, it is a lot more difficult yeah, to, to rent a, a room. It's usually about twelve, fourteen hundred dollars $1,400 a month. So yeah, it is way more difficult. And a lot of the, it's it, a lot of the ski bums are, uh, have, have a little bit of dough behind them, maybe family money. I mean, they're not trust funders, but they have they have some support from their family. So yeah, I, I'd say it's in in Breckenridge, and I would say Vale and probably Crested Butte. Maybe it's it's uh, uh, in Aspen for sure. It's a lot harder to be a ski bum. You know, you mentioned twelve to fourteen hundred bucks for a room, oh. and you know we we have a housing crisis here in Vermont, and I think frankly we're seeing housing, uh, the tightness of the housing market nationally. And I, I was thinking yesterday, because I used to be in policy and politics as well, yeah, just like yeah. you. And um, I'm wondering if, even though it's so crazy expensive to stay in a town like, you know, Vail or, or anywhere in that valley or all of these towns we talk about, it's almost like the numbers look like they might be e- equalizing almost. Like it's 1200 bucks to get a bedroom here in northern Vermont, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And the difference between where you are and where we are is like, there's just, we just don't have the jobs. So like, maybe we should all move to ski towns. Gosh, it's getting, it's, it's like, maybe there's the, the, an equalization happening. Breaking news. 
if you're going to pay, you know, 1300 bucks uh, for a room in Bug Tussle, you might as well pay it in, uh, in a ski resort. But, you know, one thing, it, it has changed. You know, when I, you know I, was, I worked in the restaurant industry. Wait, we have waiters now that could probably make 80 to 100K a year, you know, right. and, you know, right. but those are the primo jobs. You know, the, these, these guys that, you know, uh, load butts and chairlifts and stuff like that, guys and gals, they don't make nearly as much. But mostly, you know, like the hourly wage in Breckenridge, 20, 30 bucks an hour. You know, that's the only way they can get people to work because the, the, the workforce is so diminished because they can't find a place to live. But we own some rental property and we rent really cheap to locals. And there are locals making it, you know, the people without dough that are making a living, coming out here, living by the seat of their pants and, and, and doing it. But it's just not as easy as it was when, when I started. Right. And yet the place is bustling, like beyond, bustling is, is not even the right it's, term, but yeah. it's, it's cranking. Yeah. Um, as are most ski towns, ski areas, uh, certainly recently, which is interesting because we, we who have been in the industry for any amount of time, it's, it's been kind of stagnant to declining a little bit. Yeah. It, the population of skiers is aging. Yeah. Um, but it seems like it's certainly during COVID it, it's rebounded people that maybe moved away from the sport are like, wow, it really is great. It's as great yeah. as I remember here I am. Um, it, it's a little hard to make sense of, and it's a little hard to think about how sustainable it is now. Yeah. You know, you got to have affordable housing. I don't know of any area that doesn't have big affordable housing projects in the planning or execution phases. Yeah. Um, and even here again in Vermont, like we're seeing four or five story apartment buildings in relatively small towns. I never would have imagined that. Yeah. You know, I, I don't quite get it. You know, Breckenridge, uh, we have built a cause to be built. Uh, like 1,500, like I say, affordable housing, not affordable because nothing's affordable, uh, right. workforce housing units or the D district. And that's in a town of, um, of 15, uh, 5,000. And what it was like during the pandemic and, and even before we were finding restaurants having to close, you know, say for lunch, you know, for one or two days a week because they couldn't get staff. And what's more scary is we couldn't get cops. We couldn't get firefighters and, and even doctors would leave town. Um, because they couldn't, you know, they, it was just the cost of living compared to their wage. And there again, uh, in the, uh, the, the, the backcountry magazine, blue collar issue, I kind of talked about riding, uh, you know, doing a backcountry ski with three guy, uh, three or four guys. And one was wicked rich. One was a working class. And, you know, I mean, you know, so it's, it's a, it's a different world And what we in Breck were really concerned about. We wanted to make it possible for, for people to be a ski bum, then graduate to, uh, to, to be a, a citizen, uh, it, uh, you know, kind of vested in the community, get married, maybe have kids and it, be able to stay here, make a life in the ski world. So we have like, you know, like rental apartments, but also we caused, uh, to be built like little homes, little Whoville homes that, uh, are neighborhoods of, of locals. And, and that's, that's help, but it's not nearly enough. You, I don't think you can ever build your way out of it. No, sure. What's the, what's the profile of the the elementary and high school in your area are they are they full with kids are they are, is there same enrollment as there was 20 years ago what's that look like how many families are there yeah, yeah. well we have you know the, because we have a, a big influx of uh, the hispanic community uh in the last 10 15 years 20 years maybe um the school systems the population's heading you know is is remaining steady i'd say even growing um what is also growing is uh, the town underwrites various childcare centers. Um, we, we found out that uh, that you had to you had to you know book a book a, a spot in a childcare center. Uh, you know as soon as your wife and you are feeling horny because it might take uh, it might take two years to get a spot. And we also found out that people that work these childcare centers uh, they were they were quitting their you know their masters in in early childhood options. They are quitting their jobs to wait on tables because they could make more money doing that. So we kind of underwrite the salaries of uh, of some of these uh, some of these uh, childcare workers. Do you do that with like a local option or you know like a, a heads and beds kind of tax? Like how yeah, do you fund yeah. that sort of stuff? You know, we, I'm still on the town council. I'm a trim limited in April. And our philosophy, or my philosophy, is yeah, you know, with with all the people that come here. 
it could be diff- sometimes difficult for the locals to live here. You know, di- you know, just it just can be a pain in the butt, the traffic and whatnot, cost of living. And so what we try to do is take that some of that revenue and put it to you know cool rec centers, underwrite a Nordic center, child care centers. But yeah, we don't have a we have a a couple of specific taxes that go to child care uh, or one particular in uh, mill levies. And then, and then we just take it out of the general budget. But if, if, if a young couple have kids, would prefer they, after the, you know, infancy, whatever, we'd prefer them both working and not having to have one stay home and always take care of the child. So that's why we kind of uh, have uh, subsidized daycare. What is your budget for Breckenridge? I think, I, think uh, I asked that a while ago. I think like 60, so 40 to 60 million, I think, something like wow. that. We have a we have a buttload of money. Wow, but we, yeah, but we have a buttload of expenses too. You know, sure, yeah. So, well, let's get back to skiing. Yeah. I follow you on Instagram, and of course, I know you well. And and uh, you get a lot of days in. You've built your life around having a flexibility to travel in the shoulder seasons, and you tour around. Tell us about some of your favorite places to visit um, that you go back to year after year uh, when you're in your camper with Ellen and and your and your corn hunting. Say, yeah, well, there's no question about that. The Eastern Sierras, any time that the conditions are good enough, like the like last year they were great. We were there last. I think we left in April. Uh, left here in April and and skied there until you know you know on the way. Uh, skied, but also got to the Eastern Sierras. I, I, I think we left around uh, before Memorial Day. But yeah, we, you know, um, Bishop Independence, uh, you know, kind of not mammoth per se, but we like to ski in Laston. Uh, we stay away from Shasta. But Eastern Sierras, it's just great camping. We do, do we like to do a lot of free camping, you know, camp just boondocking uh, without campgrounds. But yeah, they have some decent campgrounds as well. And uh Good access for mountain biking in the spring. We bring, you know, backcountry gear and mountain bikes. And, and we, you know, try to do both. And Eastern Sierra's around Lee Vining, Tioga Pass, uh, and in that whole area. That's what we like. And, and, you know, sometimes we'll go to, we go to Lake Jackson, camping. The camping's not quite as good there. And the, uh, the snow melts earlier because it's, it's just, you know, depending on where we ski. And, uh, uh, and also we, the Ruby sometimes in Nevada. There again, it all depends on what type of snow they get and uh, throughout the year. So we pay attention to that, you know. How was the corn cycle this year in the Eastern Sierra on the east side? It was amazing. Like there's a place near Kid Mountain, you know, and we, you know, we drove our RV up the road, parked at a pull off and, and years past, I mean, we've been going there for 20 years and years past, we might, we'd park at that same pull off. We would, you know. Put you know, put on us uh, shit. Put our skis on our pack, and uh, and just like walk on dirt for a quarter mile, half mile, maybe longer. This year we were able to we were able to park our car, get out of there, and uh, and, and put on our skis and start skinning right away. They had amazing coverage. Tioga Pass and Virginia Lakes didn't even open by the time we left, um, and they had a a good corn cycle, a lot of a good freeze thaw corn cycle. And uh, that's what we like, because because right now we we're pretty concerned. You know, we're we're, we're very cognizant of avalanches. So you know, the only time we can really ski anything steep without taking a chance is is you know in in corn cycle. So I went out there. Uh, I don't know pre COVID twenty sixteen seventeen, and we were doing a story on the Red Line Traverse, which of course was pioneered by Tom Carter, yeah. Alan yeah, Bard. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, et cetera, and, and posse over the course of some years. And I talked to Tom and, and he was lamenting that the corn cycle, forget about the depth, the, the snowpack, yeah. right? That the corn cycle had become much less reliable. Um, yeah. And I, I struggled to really get that a little bit. It's certainly when we were there in June and we got winter conditions, it was gnarly, yeah. zero corn. But um, between the dust and the trends weren't the same that created that just lush corn cycle that was was very common and reliable, you know, in the 70s, 80s, I'm sure, previous to that. And do you, have you had that experience too? I think it's, 
dust is is the big the, the big change, the big variable uh, that we've noticed. And I don't know if it's if it's climate change, if it's just uh, you know hit or miss as far as weather wise. But like this year, we hit it. Uh, amazing. I, I don't think we've been back there. This year was awesome. This last spring was awesome. But I think we took like three or four years off because of that. Because, you know, uh, we have friends out there. They said, yeah, the, the, you know, it's, it's, it's a long walk on drip to get the snow. Or oh, we haven't had, you know, the base isn't good. So, yeah, I, I, think, I think dust is, is one of the things. But, uh, you know, for, uh, for me, I, I, you know, every, everything looks better. You know, everything looks better when you when you look in the past. Might be because I was younger, but yeah, I think there there is there was a more reliable uh, you know corn camp uh, back in those days, and there is the last few years. And of course, COVID screwed things up. We didn't go we didn't go out there in COVID just because traveling was a pain in the butt. I mean, we we ski it uh, out of off a of Red Mountain Pass a lot out out of uh, Silverton. And during COVID, there was a sign that saying said that the sheriff was ticketing. Any any vehicles that had out of county plates, you know what I mean. So they they didn't want you there. So so you know and so you know we had to kind of make do with other places. But yeah, COVID kind of changed a lot of that for uh, for us. You know, we had to take a couple of years off. And then the weather the weather is very hit or miss out in the Sierras. But if you hit it, it's awesome. Right. So corner powder. If you had to choose one, you know. For the rest, mine. for the next five years of your life until your wife gets your 401k. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the buddy of mine, he Gomes likes to say that never was a magazine called corn, but I like corn because corn seldom kills you. So if I had to choose one or the other, I'd take corn because I can ski steeper stuff. I can ski with less clothing. I'm not good in flat light. So yeah, I, I, I love corn. All right, let's get back. I want to throw it back a little bit to your transition from service industry jobs, cruising around the country, waiting tables to your public persona as we know it, uh, Biff America. Take us through how that emerged and, and why. How did you end up there? And you seem now naturally just like, of course, he's a radio and TV guy. I mean, he's just got this larger than life personality and this booming voice. Uh, I do want to ask you about the accent. I don't know why you still oh, have that. You're like Bernie Sanders. Sanders. You're oh, like Bernie geez. Sanders. <laughs> Lived this, in Vermont for fifty years. He still talks like he's from Brooklyn. It's like a it's like a fucking wart. I can't get I can't get rid of it. But uh, yeah, you know, um, I, I, the the only opportunity for work, I had absolutely no marketable skills. I never went to college. You know, it was a service industry. It was a, it was a good gig. Um, and uh, and and during that, I, you know, I I, I always kind of uh, uh, was was comfortable in in front of crowds and shit, probably from waiting on tables and. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd occasionally go to open mic nights and just kind of riff and try to do stand up comedy. And then I started, uh, I started copywriting, um, for, uh, for radio stations and, and doing, uh, doing voices, doing, you know, kind of different voices, character voices, uh, for small, you know, small town radio stations. And, uh, while the, while the same time I was waiting on tables and doing, doing a, a little bit of emceeing and stand up work. And first of all, Biff America sounded cool in my thirties, but, uh, but, but like, in my age, my current age, it's, it's a little bit like a bad tattoo, but uh, but yeah. So I I was doing a, a ad a ad campaign for the Magic Dance Company Pro Mail Review, and it was kind of like uh, it was like Chippendales with Cellulite, but they traveled all around the the West, you know, and as male dancers, the strippers, and they go to bars. That was big in those days, and uh, they wanted a they wanted an ad campaign that they could bring to their various you know Gillette, Wyoming, or wherever they're going it with a donut. So that, you know, so there's a campaign and they'd say, and tonight performing at uh, Joe's eatery and, and, uh, in Laramie is the, you know, so anyway, I, I created this character called Biff America, uh, for, you know, who was kind of promoting going to this thing. And then when I started doing, you know, public appearances, like either, either stand up, uh, you know, open mic or, or, uh, or just emceeing an event, Jeffrey Bergeron was just a eh, too many, uh, vowels. So Biff America was too it was French. A, he, yeah it was too, too French, French. <laughs> yeah, too ethnic. So Yee. Biff America was was uh, kind of fell on that, and then um, I kind of fell in. There was a couple of uh, there was a, a local TV station and radio stations that that uh, were looking for looking for someone to host a show. I did that, and uh, and you got to remember, I started when there was probably thirteen channels, and then there was five hundred. So you know, after about ten years with cable, you know, even I could get work. So. 
I, I think my big claim to fame, I would say, is I had I had thirty I worked thirty years in TV and radio as freelance. I you know I, I never really uh, had you know it was tied down to one particular network. I did everything everything contract labor, and that gave me a lot more flexibility and freedom. Didn't provide benefits, but probably a little bit more f- uh, money because they didn't have to pay my benefits. How much of the choice to to stay freelance was built around wanting the flexibility to ski? Hundred percent. If you really want to be a household name in this industry, you have to move to a major market. You know, and and I had some opportunities for that, but never wanted to. But with freelance, you know, I did shows in you know California, Cape Cod. I mean, all over the country for various networks. But it was kind of one and done. They would, they, you know, sometimes I'd do several shows, or you know, over the course of six months. But yeah, that, that was all it. I never wanted, I never wanted to live anywhere but the mountains. So one and done, kind of like your dating life back before exactly. you met Ellen. It, yeah, pre, you know, no, you know, premature ejaculation, no premature nothing. I was ready. So then, how did you transition to to writing from there? And and did it happen at the same time, or were you like, oh, it's the same thing? I just tell a story, have yeah. a personality, have a voice. Yeah, you know, um, with TV, it, it was just going. It was going even with the growth of the cable network with more channels. I would, uh, a lot of younger people were getting the job. I was, I, you know, so I was putting on makeup with a paint roller and, uh, it just, what the opportunities just weren't there. And so, uh, and I had, you know, I, I was able to retire and just about that same time, or maybe about five or 10 years before that, when I kind of saw the writing on the wall, computers, you know, everyone could have a computer. I can't write a letter. My, my penmanship is so terrible. My point, well, you know, my punctuation and spelling is it's so terrible that, but with computers, it, it changed, it changed all that. And, uh, I found it really, really cathartic that I, that, and I could take some time. So many times I did a lot of live stuff. I did a lot of live TV and radio. And so many times I'd say, ah, shit, I wish I said that. That would have been funnier. Or I wish I didn't say that, you know, you know, like I, I just, you know, I get fired a bunch of times for just saying something that was stupid. And, uh, so with, with writing, you can, you can look at it, you can, massage it. And so, yeah, I started chipping away at it. I was writing for a local newspaper and, and, and early on I'd write on like a word processor that, you know, or, or, a, a actual typewriter, a Royal typewriter and, and bring it and bring a hard copy in and then correct it. So yeah, it just kind of evolved. I wasn't working TV and I had some time and I just found it really satisfying, even though not nearly as well paying. Sorry about that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all right. <laughs> What the fuck else am I going to do? <laughs> oh, it's been tough, you know? Yeah. It's been <laughs> tough. Obviously, you landed in Breck by accident, and we're glad you did. But if if you were to do it again today, what are some of the places that you've been to that are like, okay, this is where I'd go, that I I could make it as a young person, I could ski, and and maybe it's just there's no ski resort there's, it's just touring now or something like that. Where would you think you'd want to land? Or is the vibrancy of a ski town just what it's got to be? You know, the, initially we were going to go to, going to go to Utah because we saw that movie, Jeremiah Johnson. And in retrospect, I think that would have been a bad choice just because I think that the whole vibe in Utah is less forgiving. So I think that if I were to, if I were to do it again, uh, you know, certainly Breckenridge, but also, um, Maybe Crested Butte, um, uh, the Tetons. Maybe we tried to do Durango, uh, and I had no idea that it was. Uh, you know, I thought about Durango at one time, but the the mountain was so far away from the town. I kind of like to be in a town that you could actually bicycle to the slopes if you had to. So I'd say Crested Butte, maybe maybe uh, some place out in California or uh, or Breckenridge. But I honestly, Breckenridge has been very good to me. It's been very very forgiving. And very accepting, and it was it was big enough, and it was busy enough that the economy was such that I could make a, a good living, and you know, doing various, you know, either, either in the service industry or or as Biff. When you came there in the seventies, I think about my time in Gunnison County, and that was the mid nineties. There were still people in Crested Butte that had worked in the mines. There were still yeah generational families that had been there a long time 
that came from the mining industry. Was it still the case in the 70s and even through the 90s in, in Breckenridge as well? And uh, are those yeah. people and those families still there? You know, yeah. I mean, there were, you know, could we because we had this big ass mine called Climax Mine, kind of halfway right. between Breckenridge and Leadville. So sure. yeah, I actually, I lived with a couple of guys that worked at the, in the mines and there were, there were some old crusty dudes that were actually had worked in the local mines and some of them, some of them are still around, you know, they don't look so good, but, uh, they're, they're still around. So yeah, there was that presence. And also when I got here, there was just, you know, just a, I bet my first few winters here, I bet half of my friends lived in cabins, mining cabins that they renovated and fixed up. And, and, you know, lived off the grid. And that was, that was my, my first couple of years. It was, it was, you know, just a shitload of dudes in town and not that many women, but our foray into the social scene at Breckridge is that we had running water, water because we were waiters. So I met a lot of people by, you know, inviting them to my house to take a shower because there was no rec center. There was no other place where they could shower. And, and, you know, it, got, it could be known that we were, we were very free with our, uh, we were very free with our shower. So yeah, there was just a, I mean, a lot of people, they weren't miners at that time that living in these cabins, they're just mountain hippies. And, and some of them are still in town, you know, a lot of them are still in town. Before we started this interview today, you shared with us that you were reading The Fall of America by Allen Ginsberg. Yeah. Why? I, I mean, I shudder to ask, because it seems just, why wouldn't you want to read about The Fall of America today? Yeah. Yeah. But it's, tell uh, us about that a little it's, bit. It's, it's this book. I, I'm a big fan of uh, the beat, the beat generation, uh, Kerouac, Cassidy, Gary Schneider. And, uh, you know, I was just kind of waiting, waiting for uh, this, this thing Saturday. And this book was kind of next to, next to uh, my desk. And it was, I was reading this, this poem about Neil Cassidy and I'm not a huge poetry fan. I'm not a, I mean, I thought, I think Ginsburg was, was pretty amazing at the time. I mean, so yeah, I, I was just kind of, stumbled i stumbled on on this and god it was uh, the copyright is 72 i probably had this since high school yeah i probably had this since high school but yeah um you know there was a magazine called westwood magazine which is i don't know if it's still in denver or not but there's this really cool writer named robin chotsonoff um and she was writing a story called kerouac's denver and this is before the internet and so and she needed just research material so she came up here and took like probably 10 of my books uh, biographies of Kerouac and Ginsburg and and all that and used that for her research but yeah I'm a big fan of uh of, of that beat generation and you know Mike Horns from from Lowell well, that's where uh that's where the bard was buried right oh yeah that's yeah. right yeah. what about the beat generation and when I think of the beat generation I think of travelers explorers yeah psychedelics all these things and and they transfer pretty well to the ski bum lifestyle right like, yeah even yeah. though they weren't necessarily skiers no um certainly some of them were so it's logical to me i wonder about you know the millennials and and my kids and like have they even heard of the beat generation or the beat movement yeah. if you will it's yeah. kind of gone a little underground is there anything like it today or or since that's that's that transformative or has that has had that much collective punch in our society? You know, I, I bet there is, but I'm not familiar with it. I mean, I, I think it's just so right now it's so diluted. The influences are so diluted, you know, for, for me, when I, you know, when I was, uh, you know, I was a horrible student, but when I was in high school, I had no idea what I was going to do. I, I just didn't want to join the real world. I knew that. And when I was like a, you know, sophomore, junior in high school, and I read on the world or on the road. It just kind of offered a a new possibility, a new alternative. But that was like one book. And and these, I mean, these people like Drew Truman Capote uh, said said that Kerouac, he he's not a, he doesn't write, he types. And you know he and, the, and some some of the the status quo was totally dissing on these guys. And so there wasn't a lot of material out there. But you know I found that then it was a kind of a quest to find more. Now I think I'm sure there's a bunch of cool shit being written and published and, and, and what, and music, but it's just so much of it. I just, I, th I think it would just be more difficult for a child, you know, for a kid, for a younger person to find something that totally resonates with them just because they'd have to look, you know, through so many outlets to find it. Cause there's, there's just so much shit out there. 
And some of it, you know, some of it's good shit. I just yeah. don't, I'm not that familiar with it, you know? Right. Yeah, it's interesting. It seems like there's there's something for everybody if you can find it. Yeah. How much of a movement is there? You know, I think about like genres and music and I'm I'm kind of heavy into this uh, red dirt country kind of stuff right now, yep. which is, it's a bit of a throwback, you know, from typical commercial country. Yeah. Um, and that seems to be resonating. You see this dude, I forget his name, but he's been this internet sensation, recorded this song about, you know, being a poor white guy in, in Appalachia and, and all yeah. the struggles he has. And, um, and both the right and the left have grabbed on and dissed. And it's like, and it's one song from one dude and it's gotten a gazillion hits. And, yeah. And, and I think about like, gosh, there's people just screaming for something to hang on to in our society today. And it's tar- hard yeah. to find, even though there's so much of it. You know, but what you're saying about Red Dirt Country, I honestly think there's some people, like, you know, I'm a, it was a huge Dylan Sands, you know, and and I think some of these guys like like uh, Steve Earle, Jason Isbell, and some of these, some of these kind of, uh, I'd say like erudite, like, you know, country lyrics, they're as close as we have to, you know, Dylan's lyrics uh, in the 60s and 70s. So, yeah, I, I think there's some, in, in, in the internet, it's possible to get stuff out, in the, but there is just so much of it. I wrote a column recently about a song I heard that that uh, the lyrics were, uh, beer is great, God is good, and people are crazy. I can't remember the rest of the song, but I felt it was pretty profound and succinct about the you about the human condition. I think that pretty much covers it, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you talk about songwriting, like how do you get your inspiration? I mean, you like for backcountry alone, you've written. Uh, I was doing the math the other day. We have published here from issue 33 to issue 152 or three. So that's like 175,000 columns. Like, so just with us alone, and then you write for all these other outlets too, your output is impressive. How do you stay A, motivated, and B, how do you find that inspiration to kind of pull all these ideas together into one piece? You know, I've always had like an active imagination but also I, I just try to pay attention. You know, like I was uh, biking with my brother-in-law back East and uh, you know, and I, I'm friendly. I, I, when I see somebody, you know, if, I, if, if we're like stopped to somebody, Hey, how you doing? What are you doing? You know, I'm just kind of, you know, I think people get it. The East coast get a, gets a bad rap about kind of being, you know, kind of stoic and quiet, but I've always kind of reached out to people and I pay attention. And I, and I also have a, Sometimes the overactive imagination, old girlfriends called it lying, but, uh, uh, yeah. So I, I just try to look at, look at what's going on and try to think about some, and, and it just pretty much comes naturally. I try to think of, of something funny about it, or I get a, I get kind of a, a, a sarcastic mindset, uh, to, when I look at something and, and try to embellish it in my writing. Um, and it's just, it's a gift, but it's not a gift as far as I wouldn't say a skill set. It's just a gift for me to be able to express that, to, to, to see something like that and kind of uh, a riff on it. You know, sometimes I'm full of shit, but it's, it's kind of my, my perspective of what's going on in the situation and in other people's minds, you know. Um, I just wrote a column for another for a paper about in one day, Ellie and I were traveling and we bumped into a woman's high school cross-country team sitting next to us at a table, just all these like beautiful le- le- girls that were tanned and athletic, but some just seemed really dour and unhappy and some seemed confident and, and self-assured. And I said, well, they're all equally gifted as far as physicality and, and, and probably talent, but some seem happy, some do not. And then I swear to God, I this is swear to, swear to God, about three hours later, we're camping at this free camping spot of boondocking and a bunch of dudes come in and I'm going, oh, this is going to suck. They're going to be loud all night. And so I went to talk to them. It was a, a, a group from a, a local seminary that was, this was their last, last foray before they go to seminary, take their vows of, their Catholic vows of chastity, celibacy, and poverty. So yeah, and, and, and there again, my, I wrote about that and my observations like could be totally wrong, but it was just fun to be able to, think, well, how are these guys feeling? So mm-hmm. yeah, a lot of it's just, a lot of it's just imagination and bullshit. 
you know? And Well, the power of observation is not something everybody has. I feel I have it. But what you have that I don't is the ability, you have this candor and, and this ability to approach anybody and disarm yeah. them. You're who I call th- that guy. Like, and you're not the only that guy, but, but that guy is the one that when he or she is in the room, it takes the pressure off everybody else because they're going to, they're going to hog it a little bit. And then for the, those of us that are just observers, it gives us the opportunity to, to kind of, uh, piggyback on their work. And you have the both gifts of observation and intrusion. (laughs) If you will. (laughs) Like I said, my brother-in-law said, he goes, yeah, I did a ride with, uh, I did a ride with Biff and 20 of his closest friends. Yeah. I, you know, they're getting, I think, I, I think a lot of it stems from the fact that I have a, a bit of a learning disability, maybe a little bit of OCD. I was a horrible student and, and I think I kind of overcompensated by, by confidence. Some of it not deserved, you know, and, and some of it was probably annoying to some of the people I hung out with. My wife kind of, it bugs her because, you know, I just like, I like to talk to people. My column that I just sent in yesterday for Backcountry Magazine was about, about, you know, I, I was all pissed off because we were skiing and these two gals wa- uh, skied by us, you know, backcountry skiing, skied by us like five feet away. They, you know, they carried on their conversation and didn't even acknowledge their presence. And so I gave them shit. And Ellie went, you know, Ellie got all pissed at me because I, I kind of confronted them in a nice way. You know, I, you know, I just kind of joined in on the conversation that I had been hearing for a while and, uh, but what's it, what, what didn't pertain to me, but I, but I said, I just kind of commented and Ellie said, you know, she opened it, the column opens with, are you insane? And it's, you know, she kind of gets annoyed when I do that, but I've been doing it since I was a little kid. Well, God bless you because I think one of my biggest pet peeves, whether it's mountain biking or ski touring is you travel past someone very closely and they don't say hello. And fucking believable. And I just don't get it. Like, I think it's a po- uh, an urban or post-urban thing where it just just like they wouldn't say hello to you on the sidewalk, yeah. they're not going to say say hello to you on the single track or the skin track. And I struggle with that. But, but the difference between you and me is I get irritated and you just jump in, you launch in. And I love that. Well, thanks. Yeah. We, we call it, uh, in, in Breckers, we call it the Boulder Syndrome. Uh, because if we're, if, we, if we're somewhere and, and someone does, you know, kind of just kind of ignores us, we say, ah, they must be from Boulder. Jeez. <laughs> oh, you know, I haven't lived on the Western Slope, uh, the Front Range Western Slope dynamic, them versus us was real. And it sounds like it still is real. Yeah. Um, as the Front Range has just exploded. But oh, uh, it's gone nuts. Yeah. 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 Well, look, Jeffrey Biff, that guy, thank you for joining me. Sure. Just a pleasure yeah. to see you. Thank you for listening and subscribing to the Backcountry Podcast and for supporting independent media. The Backcountry Podcast is produced by Backcountry Magazine, an imprint of Height of Land Publications in Jeffersonville, Vermont. Backcountry's small but mighty staff works hard to bring you stories that are beautifully produced, thoughtfully edited, and thoroughly fact-checked. Betsy Monero is our editor-in-chief. Mike Horn is our podcast producer and engineer. Our music was composed by Alex Paul. Please consider supporting independent journalism by subscribing at backcountrymagazine.com. Use code PODCAST for 10% off your entire order. I'm Adam Howard. Thanks for listening. Until next time, we'll see you in the backcountry.